Have you ever wondered how numbers were first invented? What is it that people even first needed numbers for? What process of reasoning is required to invent numbers in a society where people don't even know how to count yet? Let's discover all of this here on Inductica. Last time, we witnessed Marduk's glorious victory over the enemy tribe of the Mosul. Marduk achieved this victory by comparing his force against the enemy force, by first putting rocks into a bag, one rock for each enemy soldier, then handing those rocks back to his own soldiers and finding out that when he put those rocks in one-to-one -one correspondence with each of his soldiers, some of his men didn't get a rock, which meant he had more soldiers. This gave him the confidence to attack boldly in the next morning and win victory and peace for his people. Thanks to this victory, his people were able to develop agriculture and settle down in an area between two rivers, the Tigris and the Euphrates. Now at this point, the Babylonian people only have quantitative comparison as their one mathematical method. They have no numbers and they have no method of counting, but this still does have some actual application. Shepherds among the Babylonian people would use quantitative comparison in the following way. When they would let their sheep out, remember they don't know how many sheep they have, but when they let their sheep out in the morning so that they can go graze, each sheep that passes through the door of the pen means that they put one rock into a bag. They keep that bag of rocks on them and they let the sheep graze throughout the day. And when it's time to bring them back into the pen, they take one rock out of the bag and throw it on the ground for each sheep that walks past them back into the pen. And if at the end of this process, they still have a few rocks in the bag, they know they lost a few sheep. And so they might look at the bag and they say, we need to find this many sheep. They're still roaming out there. Remember, they won't be able to say, we have three sheep. They don't even have words for the numbers yet, but they'll be able to say, well, there's this many sheep out there and we're done. Now we brought all the sheeps back. So you can see that the method of quantitative comparison that we discovered in the last video has many other applications. So now let's understand the motivation and the reasoning that would lead the Babylonians to discover number words and counting. Motivation. As the Babylonians settled in this little village, they became specialized in their particular jobs. Some people are better at making spears, others are better at farming, others are better at raising animals. Everyone's gonna have a specialization and they're gonna start trading one another for the various things they need for survival. And this is a much more efficient economy, of course. So something that they might do during one of these trades is they might say, I want this many chickens for my spear. My spears are really good. This is how many chickens I want. They don't have the number four. This is good enough though. They could see this many. This is within the natural ability for man to differentiate. They can tell the difference between this, this, and this. Whether they have number words or not, they can tell the difference. But after a while, they would want names for these different quantities. Giving names to these different quantities one, two, three, four, that would give them a certain amount of ability to quickly understand small quantities of things. Now the problem is, is that the unit limit is still hanging over our heads. So for example, in this trade that we see here, we still don't really know if this is a good deal or not. Is this a good deal? Is we got a pile of apples of God knows how many against one spear. Is it a good deal? Who knows, maybe they can add two apples, maybe they subtract two apples. There's no way to know if that's exactly a good deal. Now you might argue, ah, does it matter? You still get an intuitive sense. Yeah, you have an intuitive sense, but remember that intuitive sense didn't work out so well for the Mosul, right, in our last video. So it's better to have an exact quantifiable amount of something so you can conduct these trades in a more disciplined, consistent fashion. So you know you're getting a good deal, you're not getting gypped out of a couple apples. So now the Babylonians might ask the following question. How can we identify the quantity of a group by name, especially when this quantity, this group has a larger quantity of units? Investigation. As I said, the Babylonians are gonna be able to invent a few number words. One, two, 
three. Now, of course, they're not gonna say it in English. It's not gonna be the same words. And the fact that they're not the same words is gonna end up being important later. But for now, yeah, they can invent these number words. But after about six, the naming doesn't really help because remember, they still can't tell the difference between this many and this many or this many quickly. They can't do that yet. They don't have the mathematical methods for doing that until someone realizes that they can list off the number words while pairing them. So here's what I mean. So let's say you have a pile of apples. You point to one apple at a time and you start speaking the number words. One, two, three four, etc. So you speak the number words one at a time and you use quantitative comparison. How are you using quantitative comparison? You're putting your spoken words in one-to-one -one correspondence with the units in this group. And when you're done, whatever number word you list at the end, that's the quantity of the group. What this is going to do, first of all, it's going to allow people to identify larger quantities. Second, we're going to be able to come up with number words for much larger quantities. Conclusion, to identify the quantity of a group, speak the number words one at a time in their proper order while mentally putting each unit of the group in one-to-one -one correspondence with your spoken words. When all the numbers of the group have been paired in this way, the quantity of the group is that of the last number word spoken. So that is the method of counting. And you can see the method of counting relies on reasoning from quantitative comparison, which was the conclusion we came to during the last video. Closing remarks. You can see that this process allows the Babylonians to come up with more number words. Because they're able to speak the words in a sequence and actually pair them off one to one, maybe you can memorize like a common poem. The words that stand in it could just simply be the number words, you know, my, aunt, sue, you know, whatever the rhyme is. I'm not good at coming up with rhymes on the spot, but you could come up with some sequence of words, each word representing the numbers. Now, here's a question. How far do you think this method of counting would get them? Some of you might be thinking, oh, well, they can go as far as they want now because you can obviously count as high as you want. No. The reason you think that is because you can count as high as you want, but that's because we have a repetitive number system. When we say 11, that means 10 and 1. When we count all the way up to 25, we're saying 20 and 5. When we get to 125, it means 100, two tens, and five ones. There's this grouping system that allows us to count as far as we'd like by only really memorizing 10 words. How many words do the Babylonians have to memorize? Well, they need a new word for basically each new quantity. At this point, the Babylonians would basically be limited to the first 20 number words because it's unreasonable to expect someone to memorize much more than 20 words. And even if you memorize kind of a long poem, after a while it would get hard to remember which part of the poem you were in and which word comes before the other. So the Babylonians can really only count to 20 at this time. But that's actually huge progress. Because remember, at first the Babylonians could only differentiate between, you know, maybe five to seven things. Now they can differentiate between as many as 20 different things. They can understand quantities all the way up to 20 and tell the difference between those quantities. So the size of the mind has actually increased about four times or so which is really good progress. If you'd like to see the next chapter in this epic mathematical journey, hit subscribe or watch the next video in the series to find out how the Babylonian Ram used written marks to expand the power of the mind even more. This video is part of a longer series dedicated to reproving the essential ideas of math and physics by showing an actual process of observation and reasoning steps scientists could have taken to prove these conclusions. Observational proofs, also known as inductive proofs, give us a deeper, reality-based understanding of these abstract ideas and demonstrate the proper method of scientific proof. This series starts with cavemen counting rocks and will continue all the way to the frontiers of quantum and relativistic phenomena. This epic story will proceed in a possible order of discovery, since science always progresses by reasoning about observations using what has been discovered earlier. 
To discover the long-term goal and the true power of this project, visit my channel page for more information. To see the playlist for this series or to see my channel, just click on the links on the screen. Finally, if you'd like more lectures like this, just go to patreon.com slash inductica. For just $5 a month, you gain access to the written, rigorous forms of these proofs, as well as my 34-hour lecture series, An Inductive Summary of Physics. I'll see you in the next video as this inductive journey continues.